Is that Earth you can see at a distance? Right. Just look at it, floating in space, hanging out with its planet buddies. You spot orange-red Mars and Jupiter with its asteroid belt. Even tiny Pluto is there. All these planets keep their distance from each other, moving along in their own orbits. They're not very social, you see. But that's a good thing. It would cause nothing but trouble if they started to bump into each other. But even though there are others, Earth is the only planet we know that has life. And we've even figured out why. It's because it was lucky enough to appear in the best spot in our solar system, in the Goldilocks zone. Scientists say the key ingredient for life is water. But, well, there's water on Mercury. This planet has deposits of water ice at its south and north poles, but only because those places never see the light. Everywhere else, water simply evaporates from the surface of the planet. Mercury is way too close to the sun. Pluto has some water too. Astronomers even think the dwarf planet might be up to 30% water, but it's frozen. Unlike Mercury, Pluto's too far away from the sun which is why all its water is in the form of ice. But Earth hovers in a perfect spot called the habitable zone. It has the right temperature for the water to remain liquid and for all forms of life to flourish. But what if Earth was the only planet in the solar system? No Mars, no Jupiter, no Mercury, no Venus. Things might have turned out a little different than what we're used to. Remember that massive asteroid that hit the Earth around 66 million years ago? Well, without Jupiter and its asteroid belt, our planet would be constantly hit by meteorites and asteroids. And some of them would be just as big as the one that caused all that sorrow to the dinosaurs. These rocky fellas would be roaming around in space with no one and nothing to stop them. And if Earth was the only planet out there, it would also be their only target. But that's not all. Look at all this huge space Earth would have all to itself. It means our planet would have an opportunity to travel a bit. It could even choose to leave the Goldilocks zone. But then, would life on the planet still be the same? So let's say Earth started drifting away from the sun. Then, it'd soon get too cold on the planet. Picture a place where the sun doesn't shine anymore. Dark, cold, covered in ice and snow all year round. That would be our Earth if it traveled further from the sun. If this happened, our cities would start to look very different. Right now, Earth is full of life. Come to any park and you'll see green trees and grass everywhere. There will be people walking, sitting on the benches, enjoying the sun you'll definitely spot someone playing soccer or frisbee. On the park's lawns, there will be people resting on their blankets, soaking up the sun. A few people will be reading their books, looking relaxed and happy. Back in space, you see Earth again. The planet is still in its favorite spot. That's why life is so beautiful down there. But wait, is it moving? Our planet is definitely further from the sun now. Has it changed things for Earth? It actually looks a bit bluer now. Down there, famous Golden California is not so golden anymore. It's gloomy and dark, much like all other places on Earth. New York is covered in ice. Even in the hottest places, the temperatures are now below freezing, including tropical destinations like the Bahamas. After a while, liquid water turns into ice. The oceans now look like giant skating rinks, Except there's no one to skate there since the planet has become way too cold to support life. Okay, then what if, instead of drifting further away from the sun, Earth moved closer, with people still aboard? Whoa, the temperatures here are crazy, too hot to handle. The climate would be getting hotter and hotter. Natural disasters would start to occur more often. Hurricanes and floods would be a common thing on Earth now. And pretty soon, the planet would get too hot for people to handle. Particles from the sun would become a serious threat. The atmosphere would be struggling to protect Earth from solar radiation. But this shield would be growing weaker. Liquid water would be nowhere to be found anymore. 
maybe only in underground deposits, Earth would look a bit like Mars, all rocky and barren. The Mississippi River would dry up and leave behind a huge canyon. All the oceans would be gone too. At the moment, the Mariana Trench is the deepest known place on Earth. It's incredibly hard to reach its bottom because of the immense water pressure there. But without water, trips to the deepest spot on Earth would be possible. It would help people uncover some more of Earth's secrets. If people still lived on the dry and scorching hot planet, that is. In other words, if someone was to explore Earth after the planet had moved closer to the Sun, everything would be completely different. But what if Earth didn't move at all and everything remained the same? The only difference, there would be no other planets around us. It would change the way people explore space. Sure, there would still be navigation, communication, and weather satellites, and maybe space telescopes. But there wouldn't be any other space objects close enough for people to send missions there. This would affect the future, too. If people had no desire or opportunity to go to space, they would invest in their home planet. They would build sky cities instead of looking for other planets to colonize. These days, if you get a state-of-the-art telescope, you'll see distant stars and other planets. The better the telescope, the more detail there is for you to see. But with no other planets out there, the picture of space wouldn't be so exciting. Stars would still be visible, and you might even spot a meteorite or two. And you'd definitely see the moon, but that's about it. Space agencies would mostly be focused on keeping Earth secure, mainly because asteroids would become frequent visitors. To protect the planet, scientists would have to figure out ways to get rid of them. Like a massive laser beam. When turned on, it could go all the way to the moon and even further. Instead of building rockets to explore space, SpaceX and NASA would be in the asteroid clearing business. People wouldn't even think of trying to contact other civilizations. If there were no planets similar to Earth, they would consider it a wasted effort. This means no radio signals being constantly sent out to space. A curious fact, in February of 2008, the Beatles song Across the Universe was beamed into deep space. It was done to celebrate both the song's 40th anniversary and NASA's 50th anniversary. In the 70s, people also sent a radio signal out into space. It contained some basic information about humans and the solar system. But it was more a feat of strength for technology than an attempt to contact any alien buddies we might have. With no planets around, the world of sci-fi would change too. There would be no more movies about deep space exploration. No massive spaceships and rockets would appear on the big screen. And since there would be no expeditions to other planets, no rovers would be sent to space to look for signs of life and explore new worlds, like what the rovers on Mars are doing right now. People would concentrate more on their own planet. For example, they would begin to explore its insides. New technologies would allow us to dig much, much deeper, all the way through Earth's crust and further. And doesn't a trip to the planet's core sound exciting? Instead of astronauts, there would be explorers of the deep underground. New drilling technologies would be invented to make the digging process more effective. There would be new types of vehicles. They would be created to drill and protect explorers from the enormous underground pressure. While exploring the world under the planet's surface, people would likely find absolutely new life forms. Those would be mysterious creatures that evolved to survive in the dark in extreme temperatures and with barely any food. It certainly helped people understand more about their home planet. Hop on, I've prepared a tour around Earth's fellow planets. Let's start with Mercury, the smallest planet in the solar system. During the day, the temperature on the surface of this planet can reach 800 degrees Fahrenheit. And during the night, it can drop to negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperatures here are so extreme because the planet has no atmosphere. Instead of it, Mercury has a thin exosphere. That's one of the reasons why Mercury is not habitable. The temperatures and solar radiation are too extreme for any organism to survive there. Now let's imagine there's a way to live on Mercury. Then what would life there look like? 
Mercury's surface resembles that of the moon. Over time, meteorites left lots of marks on it. Unlike the moon's surface, Mercury is grayish brown. Now look up. The sun on Mercury would appear almost three times as large as it does on Earth. The sunlight would be almost seven times brighter. I wonder what type of sunglasses people would wear if we lived there. Can life appear on this planet in the future? Don't get your hopes up, it's very unlikely. Now, how about landing on Venus? You might think the hottest planet in our solar system is Mercury since it's the closest to the sun. But in reality, this title goes to Venus. What is it that makes Venus boil? The biggest reason is its atmosphere. It's made up almost entirely of carbon dioxide. The atmosphere is so thick that it leads to the planet warming up non-stop. Basically, the gases in the atmosphere prevent thermal radiation from leaving Venus. So, the planet simply can't cool down. The water on its surface constantly turns into vapor. If the surface of Venus was food, then its atmosphere would be the microwave. That's why the temperatures in this world can go up to 870 degrees Fahrenheit. What would it be like to live on Venus? On Earth, seasons change because of the planet's tilt, but Venus doesn't experience any significant changes throughout the year. Things are pretty constant at night and during the day too. And what about the view of the sky? The clouds on Venus appear yellow or bright white. They're mostly made of poisonous sulfuric acid, but then why does Venus appear reddish orange when you look at it from Earth? Talking about the true colors of planets can be a tricky business. The hue of a space body might be different when you look at it from another planet. If we traveled all the way to Venus, a reddish brown surface would welcome us. The molecules of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid block sunlight coming into Venus's surface. Hence, the reddish-orange color of the planet. Oh, and did you know that Venus is often called Earth's twin? Both planets are nearly equal in size. Both have relatively young surfaces and thick atmospheres with clouds. Plus, the orbit of Venus is also the closest to Earth. That might raise a question about the possibility of life on Venus. I'm sorry to break the news, but no. Nope. Venus is not habitable. The next destination is Mars. Unlike Venus, Mars has seasons due to the planet's tilt on its axis. It also has a secondary seasonal effect caused by its highly elliptical orbit. The southern hemisphere has colder winters and hotter summers than those in the northern hemisphere. The average temperature on Mars is negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. But temperatures can also range from the poles to the equator, and they can change very dramatically within a single week. Still, not that bad compared to the previous two planets, huh? Is Mars habitable? The number one thing a living organism should worry about here is space radiation. Earth has a magnetic field and a thick atmosphere to protect its surface from radiation. Mars has neither. The planet's gravity is one-third of Earth's. So, weaker gravity and a thinner atmosphere make it harder for any living being to survive on the red planet. In 2013, NASA reported an ancient freshwater lake that could have been a hospitable environment for microbial life. This is evidence now that liquid water once flowed on Mars. This confirmation suggests that Mars could have had the necessary environment to support life. But what happened to the water on Mars? The most popular explanation is that the planet's atmosphere became too thin and cold to keep liquid water on Mars' surface. The disappearance of water might also be related to the loss of early magnetic fields. Or the reason might be the red planet's size. Mars is probably too small to keep water. So for now, Mars is not habitable. But you know scientists keep sending missions to Mars. Maybe they'll find some new information. Let's wait and see. Now Jupiter. Have you ever wondered what it might be like to live on the biggest planet in our solar system? Jupiter's environment is an unlikely place to support life. The temperatures on this planet and its composition are too extreme for any organisms to appear there. Jupiter has layers of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium. These gases fill the entire planet. Quite literally, there is no solid surface on the planet. Gases go all the way to the core, below the surface. They become liquid and turn into plasma because the atmospheric pressure there is way more intense than any place on Earth. To put it into perspective, an organism on Jupiter has to resist 1,000 times more atmospheric pressure 
than it would on Earth. Can a living being survive in such conditions? Unlikely. Jupiter is completely uninhabitable. But hey, have you heard that its moon Europa might be a possible habitable zone? Change of scenery. Saturn. It's the second largest planet in our solar system. Like Jupiter, Saturn is a gas giant ball, mainly consisting of hydrogen and helium. What about temperatures on Saturn? It's freezing. Plus, there are extremely powerful winds there. The winds in Saturn's upper atmosphere reach the speed of 1,600 feet per second. Let's compare them to storms on Earth to have a better understanding. The strongest hurricane ever recorded on Earth was moving at 350 feet per second. So the answer to the question, is there life on Saturn? Seems pretty obvious. Life as we understand it doesn't exist there. The next stop is Uranus, one of the largest ice giants. Uranus's atmosphere is dominated by ice, but it's not the only reason that causes the planet's blue color. It's also the methane in the atmosphere. It absorbs red light and reflects blue. The same goes for Neptune. Uranus is the coldest planet in the solar system. The temperatures there can be as low as negative 371 degrees Fahrenheit. Life on Earth needs sunlight to get energy, but there's nothing on Uranus that can produce any energy for life forms to thrive. The bottom line is Uranus doesn't have the environment to sustain life. Heading for Neptune, the second ice giant. What is there on the planet furthest from the sun? Obviously, it's incredibly chilly. There's neither a source of energy that bacterial life can exploit, nor a source of liquid water. Currently, scientists believe it's unlikely to find life on Neptune because of such unfriendly conditions. So, what makes our planet so livable? And I'm not just talking about human life, I mean any living organisms, even microbes. Life requires very special conditions to exist. All living beings need some sort of food, water, and the right temperature to develop. The atmosphere is a vital element. Humans, for instance, need oxygen to breathe, and they can only survive in temperatures that aren't extremely hot or cold. Another thing is gravity. All the other planets I've mentioned don't have exactly the same conditions as Earth. Life there would probably be different than what we have here. All living beings on Earth have adapted to our atmosphere, and life forms elsewhere would need to be able to survive in that planet's conditions. What would the Earth look like if it was born in another solar system? I did a little research for you to find out, and the results were surprisingly wholesome. There are some warm tropics, strong winds, and giant dragonflies. But okay, let me explain from the very beginning. Since 1995, NASA has discovered more than 4,100 planets outside the solar system. Unfortunately, most of them are either flying ice balls like Neptune or gas giants like Jupiter. But there are still as many as 161 planets similar to our Earth. And one of them is very close to us in the Alpha Centauri constellation. There are three stars in this constellation. Two of them are called Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you've probably seen them. They're very bright. Because of that, they look like one big star. They rotate around each other very slowly. And there's the third star, chilling around not far from them. It's a teeny tiny red dwarf, Proxima Centauri. It got its name because of its proximity to our Sun. This star is the most interesting one, so let's talk more about it. Proxima Centauri is only 4.5 light years away from us. Oh, and one light year is about 6 trillion miles. Yep. If we went there, it would have taken just a little over 165,000 years of traveling in a space shuttle. Oh, you think that's a lot? For the universe, it's like checking on your fridge. Proxima Centauri is much lighter and much smaller than the Sun. It's also two times colder than the Sun, with a temperature of 3,000 Kelvin. That's why we can't see it without a telescope. On the bright side, though, it will burn for trillions of years, and you don't have to worry that one day it will eat us like our Sun. And yes, our twin planet is located right next to Proxima Centauri. This planet is called Proxima b. Yeah, I know, they got creative with all these names. 
I hope you won't get confused. It's slightly larger and more massive than the Earth. This planet is located in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. It means that there can be water and even some microorganisms there. Yes, it's possible that one day we'll find some life there. But right now, we don't know much about this mysterious planet. It's probably a rocky planet like our Earth and has a similar landscape, but this is just a theory. Who knows what kind of jokes the universe can throw at us? It would be a shame to fly 165,000 years just to stumble upon a giant piece of ice or something. Fortunately, we probably don't have to wait that long. The big brains are now developing a technology that would allow us to move at the speed close to the speed of light. If they succeed, we'll get to Proxima B in just 20 years. But anyway, this video is not just about Proxima B. It's about what would have happened if life had originated not in our solar system, but in Alpha Centauri. What if we were orbiting Proxima Centauri, or the other two stars? So now, let's imagine that the Earth has replaced Proxima B. I'm going to call this new planet, New Earth. Guess I'm not very creative at naming either. First of all, the orbit. The new Earth must be about 25 times closer to its star than Proxima b is. Otherwise, it would be unimaginably cold. Let's move the planet a little closer. Excellent. The day still lasts 24 hours, but our orbital period is very high. Proxima b revolves around its star in 11 days. But we'll make it in just 8. Hey, a birthday party every week? Sign me up! Oh, hold on, there's another problem. You see, Proxima Centauri is a flare star. This means that sometimes, just out of nowhere, it throws out some stellar winds. These winds carry around a bunch of ionized particles, which then settle on the planets. Yeah, our Sun also does that, but Proxima Centauri tries to finish us off 2,000 times harder than our Sun so the radiation levels are off the scale, to say the least. Don't worry, it's fine. All we need are incredibly strong magnetic fields. They will help us create a very thick atmosphere that can protect us from the Proxima Centauri's tantrums. So now it's going to be very warm, or not. Another problem. Scientists are still not sure how exactly Proxima Centauri's planets rotate around it. What if they turn out to be tidally locked, like our Moon? Then one half of the new Earth will be a frying pan, and the other half will be some frosty deserts. Oh, it's fine, we'll just settle down somewhere in the middle. Didn't expect that I would ever say this, but it will definitely be warm at the North Pole. And if we're lucky with the rotation, we'll just get a cozy, warm planet. The average temperature is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and there aren't any extreme temperatures. On the new Earth, we have much more water. The weather is generally pretty crazy, some very strong winds and quite destructive rains that can go on for quite a long time, but you can adapt. Temperature changes are much more noticeable in the mountains. Just like on Earth, the higher you climb, the colder it gets, except it's very cold right here at the top. Because of this, the mountains and hills have jungles below and snow-covered deserts on the tops. But in general, it's almost like the Earth's tropics. The flora is very rich, the trees are very low, but lush. The thick atmosphere also makes flying easier, so there are a lot of large flying animals. Like dragonflies with a wingspan of 16 feet. Uh-huh, moving on. The sky here is much lighter than that on Earth, and very cloudy. Sometimes it may seem completely white. But the starry night is beautiful and bright. There are four suns. Our main one is Proxima Centauri. We can also see two bright Alpha Centauri stars. And finally, our old sun, which looks like a bright, distant star. I'll allow you to shed a tear for the old Earth. There's a few planets near us, like Proxima Centauri C. The host star is surrounded by two belts of cosmic dust, so get ready for some gorgeous, colorful night views. So what we have in the end is a little crazy, but a beautiful green planet. I personally wouldn't mind moving there already. What about you? Write in the comments. Alright, 
so now we know what would have happened if our Earth had been born near Proxima Centauri. What about the other two stars? Unfortunately, we won't be able to rotate near two stars at the same time. Scientists suspect that Alpha Centauri A and B have some kind of common planet that jumps from one orbit to another. But it's probably very cold. Let's choose Alpha Centauri A. Just like on the new Earth, here our average temperatures are about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But now, the temperature variation is quite large. It goes from negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit at the South Pole to 113 degrees Fahrenheit at the equator. Eh, we'll be fine close to the north. The day is still 24 hours, and the orbital period is one year and one month. It's almost the same for the Alpha Centauri B, but the orbital period is about half a year. Other conditions are very similar to those on Earth. Changes in the seasons are almost not noticeable. The temperatures don't change much either. No matter where we settle down, the neighboring star will be clearly visible, but we probably won't see Proxima Centauri. And that's about it. Of course, all this assumes perfect conditions. Just like on Earth, one slightest change, whether it's a thin atmosphere or a bigger distance from the star, and it won't end well. We got really lucky with our Earth. But even so, the chances of finding a habitable planet are very high. Even with the tiniest possibility, there will be about 15 million planets in our universe that we can find life on.